ask you a question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is Jeremy Till, the host of the Operator Podcast. We'll be taking you on a journey with us, interviewing some of the top performers in their field on how they operate and get the job done. At the end of the day, we want to be our best. We're going to help provide the information, the data, and the science of how to achieve that mentally, physically, and spiritually. Let's go! go! Our next guest on the Operator Podcast is Rabbi Neil Blumoff. It was such a pleasure to have Neil on the podcast. He's probably one of the most interesting, talented, funny guys that I know. He is always a breath of fresh air with his wisdom, knowledge, and just uh, intuition on you know where things are going, what things are. Neil is not only a rabbi, but he's a musician, a father, a community builder, very influential in Austin and national and international affairs. So just awesome to speak with him. He gave us an education on linguistics, on vocabulary, going back to ancient Hebrew. Um, so just a bomb of knowledge on the podcast and just honored to have him on as a guest and a friend you know you got a lot of uh you know talents and skills so uh, i'm really excited to have you i appreciate it i'm honored to be here jeremy that's Thank so you. cool i'm just enjoying the wonder of, of your spaces and how you continue to transform inner space outer space all good all sorts of good things man you know it's the uniqueness of our time on one level and then you know we're just had our team meeting um, yesterday with our um, our leaders, my sister and uh, my two sisters, and then uh, Nicole, our marketing director, and just talking about the evolution of our business. You know, this will be our 12th year mm-hmm. in the space, and really getting what you know talking about what a 2020, a 2023 business looks like, and right. we have to start calibrating to that space for the next five years. And you know, we've got, I, think, I would say probably like three or four years ago, we went through identity crisis of who are we, what are we doing, and why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. And we've come out of that knowing our purpose and reason, but then it's the channels and the way that you get that out to the population at the same time, you know, run a healthy, strong, surviving, and thriving business. And so I think in this time and age, you know, and we can speak to this in your own realm of, you know, there's, there's the core essence of what you do but then there's the modes that it's, you know, given how it's received, mm-hmm. and with the younger generations coming up, that is changing at such a rapid rate. So, we want to be relevant and true to our core, you know, of what we provide and do. Um, but you have to you have to upgrade, and um, and just thinking about you know the upgrades that you have to do um, are super important, or you just become old. Right. And I, and I think that's true. And on so many platforms as well, right? To translate your vision into, in, into show and share your enthusiasm with other people, it's really important. And it's not just, well, if we just put a new coat of paint on the building, everything's going to be fine. It's, it's a very different way of, of it's a systemic transformation. Mm-hmm. So um, I think having you in, uh, which I would say your name is Rabbi Neil Blumoff. Yeah. Right. That's it. And so what's neat is whenever you sit in the room and and we're real, you know, last time I saw you, you didn't have a shirt on and you were in um, uh, swim tights and running on Barton Springs, um, right? The pool. Yeah. Something in that sense, you know, all sweaty. And 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 so you go from one spectrum and then, you know, you as a influencer, you know, uh, your flock, you know, of of. Um, I don't know how you would describe it. I won't use the wrong words, but um, you know, you're you're community. leading yeah. a large community of people that are that are, you know, really um, your influence over them is is great, and and that not even just in Austin, but I know you have impact globally, and so it's exciting to to whenever you get you know at the bare necessities of fitness, and then you move into the space. You're a very esteemed, high-positioned, you know, individual that has a lot of influence and positive impact. And so I think from, you know, the listeners, um, just to get, you know, uh, 
on my end, I feel honored to have you on because um, this is magnificent. Well, I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and I really applaud all that you're doing and getting out the word about people, how they can think about their own lives and think about themselves in an entrepreneurial way. Yeah. And I think it's really great. And I think that what you and I do actually is very related, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, the way that I, that I see it is that uh, the physical and the spiritual are very connected, as you do as well. And, you know, we're just concentrating maybe on different home bases. But I think that our hopes are for... Uh, are the same for people to find flourishing, nourishing lives where they can really be a whole person. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what it's all about. Yeah. When I just happen to be planted in a particular faith in a particular way that allows me and gives me the, the, the great blessing to be able to do what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we have our own um, thoughts about uh, how we can continue to stay relevant the next, you know, five years also, as we were just talking about. It's not just, you know, if we just say that we're a spiritually based um, community, then people are going to be like, I want that because there's a lot of a lot of uh, choices for people. Mm -hmm. So that what makes somebody in something relevant for people, I think, is something I spend a lot of time thinking about. Mm -hmm. So in a quick snapshot, tell us about your current role um, and, and, you know, what you do from the standpoint um, on your day to day. Sure. Uh, well, I have a I, I have the privilege of serving a community here in Austin. I'm the senior rabbi of a congregation of a synagogue called Congregation Agudah Sachim. It's up in Northwest Hills, and I've been doing that since really 1998 when I got to Austin. And uh, before that, I was from the Midwest, and uh, outside of Chicago, and lived in New Orleans a little bit and New York City a little bit. And I really chose to come to Austin to help be part of the pioneering spirit of building this beautiful city. So to be able to connect in so many ways with people in the city beyond my own community is really a lovely uh, privilege and, and, and goodness for me. Uh, and I'm involved a little bit in the music world as well. I do, a, uh, I'm, I'm a, a, a big fan of and student of jazz and sort of what it means to be an American. And that to me, that question of identity is very important. And I've seen that and, and sort of channeled that through jazz, the music itself, not because of it's wonderment, which I like very much, but because it's a uh, specifically an American rooted art form. And that to me allows us to open up bigger questions about who we are and what we are. So I do that through a podcast of my own that I do uh, every week for uh, KUTX, which is, the, uh, is a public radio station here. Uh, it's called Liner Notes. And I talk about the connections of spirituality and jazz. And then from time to time, I work with KUT Radio to uh, produce uh, in evenings at the Cactus Cafe, which is a club up on the University of Texas campus, to present live performances of and discussions of uh, bigger questions of, of people, uh, thoughts, who we are, what we are, and what, what we need to think about as part of a Views and Brews series. So I, I curate the jazz series of Views and Brews. Mm. That's pretty much what, you know, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's again, it's a life that, that, that informs, all things inform everything. Mm -hmm. So your journey, you know, being here in Austin for roughly 19 years, mm -hmm. I know you were in the music because in New York and New Orleans, was that music based focus or was that? I did a lot of music. It was student based. I mean, that's when I was going to school and, and both in New Orleans, undergraduate, New York graduate school. But I did a lot of music uh, in those places also. Um, and yeah, it was it, those are very important guiding lights for me, those two cities of being able to sort of think about and, and appreciate who and what I am here in Austin also. Mm -hmm. And so tell us about your journey into becoming a rabbi. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Well, these podcasts are only about like, you know, an hour or so, right? Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll keep it short. Well, well, I'm just <laughs> curious because because where I really want to get into is that there's a process of decision making. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this the life you know, uh, that you chose is not simple or easy per se. You have to make very strong decisions. Correct. And, and I'm curious about that journey of making decisions and then the challenges you faced in saying, do I take this path? Do I take this path? And how you work through those decision making uh, Excellent. Times. Well, the, the bottom line, the tweet of it all is that there's no one else who's gonna do it for me. That, and, and if I'm going to be thoughtful about it and discerning about it, I want to um, be in a position where I could make those decisions. 
as opposed to being reactive to other people making decisions as well. So to me, I grew up in a wonderful suburban life, which was great. It wasn't a very um, Jewish-identified life in my public schools and the way that I sort of articulated life. It was fine, loving parents, loving family. Um, but it was just sort of in the background noise, being Jewish. It was just kind of a... And, uh, and I was looking at other things in my life. And, uh, and it was really in college sort of thinking about um, the larger questions of being and who I am. And people always sort of saying, well, you're Jewish. You tell me what did Jews think about X, Y, or Z, right? And I felt, remember feeling ashamed because I couldn't really answer those questions. I was like, you know, I don't really know. So in the back of my head, it was like, well, who are you really? What, what are you? And uh, I was I had the great blessing of being able to study uh, in Poland as part of my uh, collegiate uh, work. And at the same time, there was, if you remember, you were very young. Back in the day in 1991, there was the what we call now the first Gulf War. And I remember looking at pictures uh, on television of seeing uh, Israelis in, in sort of bomb-proofed rooms as scuds would being launched from Iraq. And I remember sort of saying, I have an affinity and I have a connection with folks who I don't even know. And why is that? What is that? So I decided to explore it and investigate it. Very long story short, um, when in Poland I had the opportunity to visit these death camps and sort of seeing uh, on the walls of a place called Auschwitz, which was a horrible place, these pictures filled from top to bottom, pictures of life, of social life, of people exercising or playing games or dancing or eating or enjoying, and all that whole civilization was sort of wiped out. And I remember sort of looking at those pictures by myself saying, I'm, there's no one else. I have, to, I have to answer these questions for myself. I can't just disappear. I don't have the uh, ability. It's not good. It's not in, I don't have the integrity to just sort of say, I don't need this anymore. So something awoke in within me to sort of say, I'm the guy holding the baton right now. And um, so I decided to learn about those things. And so I decided, first of all, to go to school to become what's called a cantor, which is somebody who's steeped in the liturgical sacred music traditions, because that was what I knew. So I was a cantor here in Austin in my congregation from 1998, essentially, to about 2005. And at that point, I had a chance to take a, a sabbatical. It was about seven years, and I'm like, you know, I need to sort of refresh my mind. And because I, at that point, I was very confident with my Jewish identity. You could ask me questions, I was all set. And I was ready to leave, I was ready to go do something else. So I decided to take about three months of discernment. And I went, uh, I like trains. So I went on the uh, Trans Siberian Railroad from, uh, I was up in St. Petersburg, Russia, and took uh, about a month and a half to get to Beijing, China, and did a lot of reading and silence, meditation, that sort of thing. And I decided to come back after that trip that I was going to double down and sort of be a rabbi at that point and really become a servant of my people and servant of trying to make the world better. So if you could say the first part of my journey was for myself, sort of rooting myself in my traditions, and the second is to sort of say, I, I got it, and now I'm going to help other people and be available to other people to learn their work and to help guide them in their work. And that's sort of where I've been practicing ever since. Mm -hmm. that's great that's the nutshell man yeah you knocked it out <laughs> and so in that time you also have a family I do. and a wife and children yep so where was that a part of the process very important so met the wife uh, very early 18 so uh, we got together and then uh, we were married at 22 and uh, that really set the course of my life and she's uh, the foundation on which all is revealed and all is able to happen and, you know, by the blessings of God, we've been having, we have three children, and uh, and they're incredible folks, each unique in their own way, each responding to the lives that we live in our own way, and uh, and I'm just happy to, to help teach them and cheer them on at the same time. Mm. So, you know, as we sit here in the 21st century in 2017, and you have your community here in Austin, you know, this is a pretty big question, but, you know, with the chaos and the tra transition of time and then, you know, um, with traditions in your faith and moving forward, where do you really see things within uh, the Jewish community? Well, I think we need each other. And I think that rather than sort of say, well, I've got my 
corner and you've got your corner and we're all just going to do our work together and sort of agree to disagree or just kind of wave at each other every day as we sort of see each other. I think our, our time and place needs more engagement. And I think the ability to be confident in who we are and at the same time reach out and get to know other people different from who we are, I think is, is crucial for us to, uh, to continue uh, with that strategic plan for us to not only keep our businesses afloat, or our, but to keep our world and our culture and our, and our in America afloat as well. So the Jewish world, I think, is, uh, has been used to, unfortunately, the ravages of hate that have just gone unchecked in our world. And I think that something that we've learned is that we want to be and need to be outspoken to be radical forces for love and inclusion and uh, allowing people to introduce themselves together. And, you know, in addition to the great spiritual work in, that I get to do, you know, the physical aspect is very, very important to me as well, the, the, the training and the, and the work, and to be able to publicly show that to people. I mean, there's a, there's, it's very important to sort of, you know, do what you need to do so people can still think you're a rabbi and doing what you need to do, right? Posting pictures of worship or speaking, hopefully, cogently about holidays and stuff. But I think it's important for people to see that uh, I try to live my life as one who knits holy moments together and brings people together, not for the purposes of making them Jewish or thinking a certain way, but rather for people to begin to have conversations with each other to realize that we're really all in it together. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. I see the Judaism specifically for me responds to the important issues of spirituality, the crisis of identity, who am I, why, and is my life significant, what decisions do I need to make in order to flourish in my life. That's for me. Also, in, in addition, what I think it does is it allows people to begin to have conversations that are important to them, not just what I want to say. The advantage that I get, Jeremy, when I'm, when I'm with people is that mostly most people people don't talk about sort of just BS stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, we can talk about things that just sort of keep us connected, but most people want to drop in a little bit deeper when they, when they talk to me about their own issues, about their own things that maybe they're struggling with, but also issues of, of existence. And I think that that is a crucial aspect to, um, being active and, in, and animated in this world. Mm -hmm. So when I think about, you know, faith in America, and you think about you know the Jewish faith and the tradition in that in that space. You know, I was raised Catholic, and um, there's my parents very you know attended mass every weekend, and my mom actually converted. You know, probably when I was probably like 14 or 16 years old. Um, but with with the Jewish tradition, you know, it, sometimes for people it can become a little confusing. Sure. And so could you kind of talk about like, you know, being born Jewish sure. and then practicing your faith or if someone were to want to become Jewish, you know, what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't work on commission, man. So it's, it's, that's not what, but what I do think for me is because I grew up Jewish, but it was sort of, again, sort of in the background for me, but the recognition that it, that it has the technology within it to begin to answer questions of identity and thought and and responds in a way that doesn't just sort of paste, you know, bandage over everything saying it's all going to work out. But to me, Judaism reveals that we have to do hard work in order to get the gains that we want. So to me, that's a very important aspect of who and what my faith demands, that it's not the answer that is so important, but it's the questions that we ask about the world around us that are so, so important to us. So to me, anybody is welcome to, to study and to think about things just because I think it's a value added in their life. And again, it's not at the expense of any other faith or religion, and I'm very respectful of and enjoy speaking with people who have very strong faiths themselves. And in fact, I'm, another thing that I get to do in the town is I get to teach at the Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. So I'm teaching a biblical Hebrew uh, class there this fall semester. And that's for upcoming pastors and interested folks who are certainly interested in, in, let's say, Hebrew, but not necessarily interested in the theology of Judaism, which is awesome. Because the ability that you have to sort of present things and say, take what you can, I think is very, very important. If people want to become Jewish, that's really a, an inner journey that they can take on their own. And again, it's not something that I sort of push on people. 
if people want to learn and get involved in a community, a minimum process for people taking that on would be at least a year. So it's not like, you know, you sort of get somebody and you sort of, you know, have a ceremony and poof, it's done. There's a real sense of, of not only what one needs to learn, but what one needs to take on as well. And not just the beautiful actions of being feeling that you're obligated to be a blessing in this world. A question that we ask prospective people who want to be Jewish is, do you know what you're getting into, essentially? Do you realize that being Jewish, you're assigning your soul to being part of the Jewish destiny or the destiny of the Jewish people for good and for ill? Because being Jewish is hard. It's, uh, it's, it's, as you said, it's filled with misunderstandings among other people, especially if people are raised in a certain way to think that difference is bad. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a lot of, and that's one of the reasons I came to Austin so many years ago is to sort of just be a force for good for people and just sort of be out there and people like it or think it's cool. Then just to realize that there are people who are very interesting, who are not looking to get you to be like them or you need to be like them, but the world is filled with a pastiche of, of, of amazing difference and amazing thoughtfulness um, Mm -hmm. across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So kind of pivoting towards music, Cool. And your relationship with music and faith and the spiritual realm, you know, what is that kind of introing into that for you? What does that really look like? Wow, that's a good question, man. Thank you. I love that. To me, uh, music is the most powerful mode of communication of all, just because you don't necessarily need words to it, right? Um, And to me, music allows us to sort of be in a language that is shared by everybody. If you listen to an instrumental piece, for example, you don't need to know what the people are saying. You can feel it, and then you can exp- you can feel that with somebody else. So there's a saying in Judaism. It's a mystical book called the Zohar, and it says that there is a key to everything in the world. There's a key to every door, to every problem, and the key of music opens them all. Mm. And to me, that is the most important aspect of, of sort of getting real with people or realizing that you know, we li- so many of us, as Kierkegaard would say, live in bad faith, right? And 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 one of the goals of the world is to sort of take the take the scales from our eyes and to sort of see what what is out there, and not to be afraid of it, and to be able to engage in it with people who are like-minded and willing to go on that uh, awesome journey together. Mm. And I don't again, I don't see so much difference with you know what you do. I mean, if people have goals for their body, if people have goals physically, you can talk about it all day. But until you start getting to it and, and sort of developing a lifestyle of wellness, then, you know, that's when the goals are going to be starting to be met and you'll see results. And to me, spiritually, it's, it's very, very similar. Mm. What is, um, do you have any passages or, you know, how you describe like uh, text that really is kind of a foothold for you? Wow. Uh, so we, this would be a good, I'd like to hear yours too. Mm. Uh, to me, though, these would probably be surprising for you. Again, for me, Judaism is about encountering the world and being critical of sort of what's around there. So to me, books that resonate for me are the book of Job, for example. Job, who was uh, perhaps unjustly suffering and began to ask these questions and didn't really get a great answer from why this would be happening. Um, I like the book of Esther very much. book of Esther where people recognize that God is concealed or hidden and that they have to sort of figure things out on their own without having to rely on um, something greater than themselves necessarily. Those two books really are anchors for me. And that's a very interesting read to read, say, the book of Esther, when uh, Queen Esther and the characters of the story don't have God who's sort of intervening in their life with, let's say, the book of Exodus, which talks about God sort of single-handedly bringing the Israelite slaves out of Egypt. And I think that those two ideas together, one being you don't always, you can't always find God in your life, and the second, sometimes you're overwhelmed by God, are, are, are very beautiful companions together. Hmm. But if you're asking me sort of like verses and stuff, or are you just asking me kind of like bigger picture stuff? Mm, maybe a verse. Yeah. Um, to me, the, a verse, I think it's, well, it's definitely Ecclesiastes. I think it's chapter 3, uh, verse 14, where it says that God visits those who are themselves pursued, which means that if you think about your life, if you're engaged in your life, if you have questions about your life, then you're going to open yourself up to something bigger. If you just put your head down and say, this is too much, or I'm feeling overwhelmed, 
you're going to miss a lot. So to me, it's that if you are able to allow yourself to be engaged and to sit in the uncomfortableness of being engaged, to sit, and I know you've spoken about this too, sit in the pain, right? Mm -hmm. And allow yourself a chance to recognize where you are and not flinch, then I think your life is going to be incredibly much more rewarding and, and meaningful and enriching. Mm. That's good. How about you? You know, I don't think I would say that I have something specific, but one that was even I was thinking about um, is uh, in Jeremiah where he 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 talks about um, you know the Lord has duped him, and you know wherever he goes, you know everyone wants to kill him, hmm. but you know he says you're imprisoned in my bones, and I cannot but help to scream out your name, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why because I've always felt connected because um, even in saying that thing, feel my spirit move and inside of me just you know it's just like it's, it's this force the of of god seeking more you know um commitment more um no matter the struggle that you walk through you know um but you know it's just really getting into you know the bible for me old testament new testament is just really getting the that that nurture of the spirit realm to really consume that as food you know and really getting that mm -hmm. you know um is really started to dawn on me more now at this point in my life than than ever before um so i think i'm definitely in a I've gone through different phases because i don't know if you knew i when i was 18 i actually stepped into a, a seminary mm -hmm. for a short period of time i think um, i remember that because i was you know thinking about becoming a priest and um and so it's always been a spiritual journey for me for a long time um seeking you know faith and understanding and all that good stuff so um, yeah, it's not something we normally talk about. You know, it's sort of just we just kind of like, hey, that's cool, and then what we do in our free time. But I think this engagement is really important because that that message of Jeremiah that he was born essentially a prophet, being able to to, to animate that way, is something that never leaves you. And even though you're not formally a priest, you still have that passion inside you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really good thing, and it's translated to your business model, and it's translated to what you're doing here now. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you too. Um, how you identify with the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for you? It's a great question. I'm not exactly sure because I know that in Catholicism and Christianity, it's, it means something beautiful. Mm. Uh, but I would sort of, I would translate that into Hebrew just because that's just because that would help me. Ruach Elohim is sort of the, the and, and this idea that it was the breath of life that sort of makes us alive. So that goes back, of course, to the Garden of Eden story. Mm -hmm. And rather than just be this sort of clay or this, this homunculus, this thing that is just going lumbering through the world, it is the engagement with God that breathes life into us that allows us to become the incredible, majestic beings that we are. And that to me is the spirit of God. That to me is that we all possess it. And it's all part of who and what we are. And when we die, that is ultimately what leaves our physical form and is regenerated back into the uh, infinitude of what God is. So it's not something that can be created or, or destroyed. It's something that always is, and we get it. And that is the amazingness of being alive at this point. And then with our mortality, we get to share that with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, you know, because what has really happened for me from the actual physical standpoint comes back to breath. You know, and, and really for me in the last um, now year and a half, breath has become a real focal point for me because um, how much influence it actually has over the physical body. And as I've been, started to create my structure, because, you know, stepping back into my journey, you know, as I started to seek health and wellness and fitness and, you know, self-development, spiritual de development, um, what I came to find at the in the early days was it was nutrition, then it was physical fitness, you know, um, resistance and cardiovascular, you know, training and all that stuff. And and when I got into my 30s and started to understand, you know, the stresses of life, you know, rejuvenation and recovery became even more important, mm. you know, and, and what I fell onto was breath. 
you know, and, and I think there's a very powerful spiritual aspect of breath, you know, from the moment you breathe to the moment you breathe your last breath mm. and then how that really encompasses our body and, and, and what breath does to physiology and psychology of the body because it has so much connection to your um, hormonal response and, and how life is really given to you. And um, like these parallels, like bring me to another aspect that has become very prominent to me in 2017 was the heart hmm. and, um, and how prominent the heart is. And, and what I see in this time and age that we're in, what I feel is that science is now starting to really catch up to faith hmm. where you couldn't really, you could say what you believe, but you couldn't pinpoint it with measurables. Um, and, I, and I stumbled onto this um, group called Heart Math Institute where they study the heart from a data center and how they study heart rate variability and how the emotions are stored there um, or measured there um, in your heart rate and the variability of that when it shows up on the electrical grid. And, and so it's like I've been really getting like really um, what I – what heart math calls and when I've started to use the word is resilience, you know, and, and resilience and what resilience really looks like when we think about breath, heart, and, you know, the aspects of the faithful life in filling the heart, you know, has is, is been this new journey of understanding how the two worlds, you know, intersect, uh, health and wellness, uh, longevity, um, and then the desires and the and the experience of life and the fruitfulness of life that comes from that then rolls into you know our, our nutrition and our physical fitness and how all these worlds really collide and so I, I kind of bring that into our conversation about you're talking about you know the breath and and where you translated from spirit into Hebrew and and you know um, the beginning of life on the earth you know the next topic I would talk about is heart mm-hmm and you know, heart was a very, you know, two years ago is when it really entered back into my mind that I was having a real heart processing of what heart meant. Mm -hmm. um, but as I started to study the science of the heart and how, you know, the heart is really that preset to all intention, you know, and and so I'm curious of your, you know, insights into heart and how you deal with your flock and your community and dealing with what some individuals call like heart issues or the heart. What, what's your take on that? Well, Jeremy, that's so profound. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I love that. And I love that connection with breath and heart. And heart is really to me where it's at. Uh, the breath is, I mean, what, how does it sound when we breathe? And I just want to sort of concentrate on that for a minute. That is actually one of the names of God in the Jewish tradition. It's just Aleph. It's just a silent letter, but that's what it is. And that if we pay attention to that, it can inform so much of our life. And right regularly when I teach, a lot of people can get intimidated and so they don't know the material and whatever. All the time I begin with like a singing with something, like something wordless that people can begin to sort of drop into. And it's just, it's a matter of allowing the breath to begin to flow. And to me, that's one of the best ways of I did that recently. I was teaching at the University of Texas a bunch of uh, high school kids for a summer session. Uh, Peace and Reconciliation Camp is what it, they called it. And they're looking at me and they're like, oh my God, what's this guy doing, right? So I just had them sing with me. Just again, like a, a wordless melody. And after three minutes of that, they're like, we're good. You're done. Thank you. You know, it's been that we had to 45 minutes of stuff. But, but I think that that's really important. And that translates to people's hearts. Because very often... For me, people will begin a conversation and you have to sort of discern what's underneath the words that they're saying. Like, what are they really asking? What are they really looking for? Uh, they may come with a, what's called in psychology a presenting problem. But what they're really asking is hidden beneath that. And I don't know if you've ever come across this uh, um, idea of uh, doorknob conversations. Have you ever heard of that phenomenon where you spend, let's say, half an hour or 45 minutes with somebody and then they put their hand on the door to say goodbye and they're like, oh yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you. And that's actually the thing that they wanted to ask you in the first place. And that's the thing that they really wanted to talk about. Uh, so Judaism uh, 
the the credo or sort of the foundation of Judaism is Deuteronomy chapter six verse four, which is Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then right after that it says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And if you look in the Hebrew, that word for heart, which is lave, is actually plural. What is going on there? So it says, literally, love the Lord your God with all of your hearts. Well, how many hearts do you have? Like, what does that mean? And the connection is that the intellectual and the emotional are tied together. In the ancient days, heart also meant the seat of wisdom, a place of wisdom. And it also means all those ineffable things that we feel and can't really put into words as well. And where those two places kiss is sort of where we recognize to be our heart. So as you say, I think the heart and the understanding of what the heart is capable of and what the heart carries is at the root of what everybody is looking for, what everybody hopes to have as they address their own insecurities and and issues of life. Mm -hmm. So keep doing that. I think that's really important. Yeah, it is um, exciting. You know what? What heart math really talks about is is coherence of the unification of mm-hmm. heart and well, there, mind. Well, there you go. And and now with science, through the megahertz and electrical current of the heart, it's measurable, and it can be shown through you know wearable technology of mm-hmm. the connection. But it also has come back to the study, which is interesting also with Jewish tradition of diet Mm -hmm. and the health of Mm -hmm. the gut. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about three brains, the gut, the heart, and the mind, and how the health of all three of those are vital for a flourishing individual. And and it's that, again, that crossroads I see. It's funny because, you know, it's like you look at these, this ancient tradition and how we circle back again we come up with all these great techniques in this new way and it's like no it's been in it's in clear in right. front of us you know uh, it's interesting I, I just want to mention and by the way resilience is one of my favorite words so thank you for that too we talk about the wilderness right in the jewish the story is that we've been wandering in the wilderness for so long and everybody projects that to be an external wilderness but it's really the internal wilderness that we're in as well not just the soul but the gut also there's so many things we just don't understand about our body and how and why and what affects it not just diet but the 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 emotions the stresses and that inner wilderness is something that i I, i'm really glad that we're talking about also because i think there is a connection that is found as you say in our in our ancient texts Mm. so exciting I'm encouraged. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, so here's another thing that's very interesting to me. So the word for truth, because everyone thinks that they want what's true, right? The word for truth in Hebrew is the word emet, or we may know it from emet, right? The name emet. Emet, it means truth, uh, but it also is comprised of two things. So the aleph that I talked about before is sort of this infinite breathing this infinite awareness this connection of of wisdom and 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 um, and mind and heart and all that thing the word mate like am met the word met means death and if one has and possesses this sense of um, understanding that one is on this journey that one is breathing then that is what sort of allows us to have life and once you take that olive away then, then death does occur. So I think knowing about the heart, the mind, the gut, the body, the soul, all of that is so important to keep us even literally alive. Mm-hmm. That's good. Well, I definitely want you to sing. <laughs> did you know that was coming? Yeah, I did. I knew that was coming, man. Yeah, we want you to. Cool. You know, I don't know if I have any more questions for you. That's cool. Do you have anything you'd like to share? Um, what's moving you to uh, what the operator podcast? What's what's moving? Well, how did that come up? Yeah, so so it's unique in the sense that you know I've been through. I'm an entrepreneur, and so I just like to create things and create you know connection and create profits and and just make things happen in this world. And 
And, you know, I used to do probably six or seven years ago, I used to train affiliates in the business of CrossFit and, and teach them how to run their boxes. But it was falling short for me. I was just like, yeah, I'm not really a full on systems guy, you know, and, and everyone's different and boxes are different. And so I let that, you know, go to rest. And, and uh, but I always wanted to work with people and educate and teach people. And what I found was, you know, we, podcasting was a phenomenal platform i feel like i'm talented to be able to get on and to talk and speak and so a year ago in june we started the amplify podcast and that ran for a year and we actually got a cease and desist from amplified credit union um which was ironic um you know but i had read a book um called the obstacle is the way by ryan holiday and and it really flipped my perception he's steeped in stoicism um philosophy and and you just that the obstacles the way I started to change how cease and desist looked versus like oh my gosh what am I gonna do to this is an opportunity mm -hmm. and amplify was great because we could amplify people's stories but what I really wanted to get into was helping individuals on their journey and and what I get is usually it's the individual what their mindset is and now what I'm saying their heart set is mm. is really the governing board of how people operate in their lives for success and failure and, and emotional you know processes because it's really changing the perception of what life looks like and so the operator is you right we have this system inside of us that i believe is the most you know the technology that is inside of the human body is the most advanced technology in the war the universe and when we really are able to assess, access all of its, you know, it is, is tremendous. Mm -hmm. and, and so when I say the operator is really operating their life and the, the, the research I've been doing for the last, you know, 20 years on the physical body, then the mental body, and now with the heart and the gut is what I get is, is the operating system that the person individual, once they come to understanding and the more aware they are of that, they will be able to uh, really choose how to participate in their life. Hmm. And so what we're really starting to scratch the surface on is intersecting this world of becoming the operator of your life and really gaining more knowledge and awareness around how your operating system works. And then, you know, right now is that, you know, the operator podcast is to interview individuals on what you know their story is and who they are but it's really the you know under the iceberg is is really the best creating prototypes for individuals to gain control of what's happening in their lives and so where we're moving towards is really starting to understand gut health heart health and mind health and then give tools for people to get better access to that and then build a foundation so they can live uh, fulfilled fruitful lives um, and so we're just at the beginning of that. And, and, and um, I really feel this is becoming really a life purpose for me, um, you know, that can be structurally. And I really ask for higher, you know, uh, awareness from God to show me um, how to communicate this and, and to properly position it. So I think we're at the beginning stages of that and, and putting it into actual curriculum to be taught. And um, I have a real focus on uh, men and uh, empowering men to gain back the um, control of their, you know, emotional, mental, um, spiritual states. And it begins with breath. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we're doing with the Operator Podcast. And um, yeah, that's where we're at. It's amazing, I love that. Uh, so in a few weeks are High Holy Days, the main holidays of, of thinking about who we are and where we're going are coming up in the Jewish tradition, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And I'll be devoting some, a lot of my speaking, because that's when a lot of people come out to hear, uh, to this idea of positive psychology and, and concentrating on the things that are really, really important as opposed to the negative stuff, like, like I can't do this thing yet or whatever. Who are you and what can you do and how are we able to transform our lives with the skills and the sets that we do have? And, and I think that's really related to a lot of what you're so talking about. And the last thing I just want to say before we sing we sing, <laughs> not just me, brother, is, uh, is this word shalom, which you may have heard of. And it, a lot of people just translate it as peace, like P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. However, it really means wholeness and wellness. So when you wish somebody shalom, 
you're wishing them a whole life, a life where gut and heart and brain and body and soul and spirit all flow together. And that's, that's why I think that we're, we're, very, we're cut from the same cloth in that way of looking to, to inspire others to succeed and thrive where they, where they can. And I think that that's really, really important. So uh, we're going to sing together. All, All right. right. You ready? Sure. So this is a melody that I learned from Nathaniel uh, Goldberg. Oh, by the way, man, I wanted to tell you this. So just be careful that the Operator podcast is not Cease and Desist by Milton Bradley in the game. You know, that Operator game. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> so I'm just not giving anybody ideas. But yes. Just, just saying. So. Got gotcha. you. All right. So this is a melody that was, uh, that was taught to me. I was in Jerusalem in 2014 when there were uh, missiles being launched against uh, Jerusalem willy-nilly and there was a uh, sirens air raid sirens would come out of come out of nowhere and you know a lot of people didn't know what to do so breathing 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 is the first step and this is the melody that we learned from Natanel, and i'd like to share it with you and you'll get it a couple of times and we'll we'll get it together is that okay. all right okay it goes like this Ya la 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 Ya la 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 That's the first part. Second part. Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Last part. Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la la So you can imagine people just learning that for the first time and then just putting their heart and soul and gut into it. So I'm going to sing it a couple of times you're going to you're going to jump in. <laughs> All right? <laughs> okay. You ready? Here we go. Yeah. Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Try that with me Ya la 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 One more time Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Again Ya la 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 One more time Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la la Ya la 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 Ya la la, try it please. Ya la 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 Ya la la Ya la 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 Ya la la We do the whole thing. Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la 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 Ya la la Ya la 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 Ya la la How'd that feel, Jeremy? That's great. That's how it opens <laughs> up, man. That's how it all that's how the heart opens. That's how the that's how the gut opens. That's a that's a strategy of of just entering into a connection with somebody with nothing nothing needs to be said. I tell you what, you looked across the table like you were doing your first burpee. 
It's good stuff. All right, Neil. Well, we appreciate you, brother. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Yes, and sir. great success to you. And in the times when we think that all is at risk, the sacred relationship is what we have. And let's take advantage of being present with each other. Amen. Thank you for joining us on the Operator Podcast. Please join us on our virtual platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and we will see you soon.